In this session we want to consider the UK government's approach to training and development. Now this is for illustration purposes only. It shows the type of approaches that the government may take or indeed that governments in general may take to promote training and development. The other point that's worth noting in the context of this session is that this is an area that changes and it changes on a regular basis. Um, so the material in here may become obsolete, uh, it may be replaced by new initiatives and new ways of thinking but um, it's still worth looking at because it tells us the way people think about training and the way governments have approached training at least in the UK and in, at least in the early parts of this century in the um, 2010s onwards. So let's look at uh, this uh, and see what we can get. So we're going to try and uh, review the types of government led skills initiatives and discuss the role of government in training and development and lifelong learning. So those are the objectives that we're trying to set out. Now government aims to rebuild its labour industries. Uh, in order to accomplish this it's vital to prepare individuals for the world of work. So government takes part responsibility for the quality of the workforce and really I suppose this starts with school with school and at the end of school colleges and the provision, provision of higher levels of education and also uh, for those more inclined towards practical work towards apprenticeships and practical skill acquisition so the government aims to build the labour force to make the country more productive, more efficient and more competitive. The UK government offer training and development initiatives to help individuals develop skills, competencies and experience in their specialist fields. So the government through the taxation system finances various initiatives to try and help develop the workforce. To develop the workforce to have the skills, the competencies, the experience and to, to use these to uh, become more efficient, to help the companies for which they work, um, to produce better products, more innovative products, uh, higher quality of workmanship and so on, so that the, there is a return to the country uh, through higher taxation uh, from from work, um, greater taxation on profits and in this way the the country benefits, the individual companies benefit and the workers benefit. Now government initiatives, well these are promoted through the Department of Business Innovation and Skills. Now the names of government departments may change from time to time as well. New Prime Ministers, when, when they arrive, like to make their mark by changing the names of departments or sometimes to refresh the government uh, if it's been in power for some time they seem to like to change the, the names of government departments also. So what we've got here may be historic but again that's not the point. The point is that these are initiatives that have been taken and they indicate the types of measures that governments will be looking at to try and promote efficiency within the labour market. We also have um, a skills funding agency which tries to promote skills. Now many of these um, uh, sections I won't make a lot of comment on other than to say that the skills funding agency tries to promote skills. It's almost self-explanatory. Uh, investors in people is quite a big topic and it's one worth a little bit more uh, consideration later. Uh, sector Skills Council um, looking at skills within particular sectors of the 
the country in engineering skills for example or um, catering skills in some areas or hotel management or um, all sorts of skills and looking at it by sector and seeing what skills need to be promoted within those sectors. Learn Direct is uh, a government initiative to try and promote education with a practical bias and generally speaking the courses are free uh, some premium courses may cost some money but generally speaking they're free um, some of them are online uh, some are operated through centres so the government has uh, a layer of provision over and above the, the more traditional colleges and institutions of that sort. There's also the Institute of Personnel and Development, a particular institute, professional institute, chartered institute, which means uh, it's highly thought of and, and approved uh, of, and the institute tries to promote skills and training and a professional approach to, to work. There are various apprenticeship schemes that are in place. Um, again, taking school leavers and trying to get them to acquire the skills for, for particular trades or particular um, areas of work. For example, uh, the building trade may take on apprentices the car industry may have apprentices. Um, there are all sorts of areas where apprenticeships uh, are used and this is to the benefit of the company because the the people who take the apprenticeships uh, who are probably 17 years old um, thereabouts, these people are can be molded by the company to have the skills that the company require but at the same time the the people taking the apprenticeships are acquiring acquiring skills many of them highly marketable later in life so it's learning by doing learning by working for the company and within the apprenticeship schemes there are all sorts there's one called the new deal not to be confused by uh, or with i should say the the new deal program in america uh in the 1930s um the New Deal in the context of the UK is uh, trying to collaborate with companies to get them to take on apprenticeships and take on apprentices and issue apprenticeships I should say and helping the companies to to take on workers. Uh, Train to Gain was another scheme that was put out and NVQs the national vocational qualifications which rewarded apprentices and people undertaking training with qualifications to show exactly what their their level of competence is so that they become more marketable in the labour market. Now, I said earlier uh, investors in people was one area that um, warrants a little bit more consideration it's been operating since 1991, uh, Investors in People, and ha it has dedicated their time and expertise to transforming organisations through effectively utilising their human resources. So it, it rewards organisations with accreditation if they're doing a good job with their staff, training their staff, promoting their staff in areas to, to take on new skills and new competencies and developing the staff and being involved with the development of the staff. So the company is investing in people but of course the company is benefiting from having a more skilled workforce also. Um, it's very popular in the UK. It has helped many people within the, the workforce to acquire new skills and to uh, make more effective contributions and also to promote their interest and motivation in working. It provides support, mentoring, online tools, resources which are made available online to help organizations reach their aims and 
prospects for growth. So it helps companies to grow and it helps the companies by providing facilities to the companies and working in collaboration with the companies to develop their workforce. So it's, uh, it's the company developing its workforce but receiving help from investors and people and at the end being assessed by investors and people and if they've done a good job they can be awarded the accreditation of an investor in people. So investors in people offer organizations the support to improve financial performance, um, motivation, leadership skills and employee engagement. It helps uh, the company to motivate its workforce and develop leadership skills and so on. Um, it has an impact on productivity because if the workers are more efficient and more highly trained the chances are they're going to be more productive. There's a better chance of innovation and better product service also if the workers are highly trained and highly motivated. So there's another benefit to the, to the company and better quality with all aspects or within all aspects of the organization. As the work flows through the organization it's recorded more precisely, it's monitored, it's checked. There's better quality in the product and the workforce have greater pride in what they're doing because they are more highly trained. And the, the workers will be more loyal to the organization also because they see the organization as wanting to help them so they they respond they respond to that type of employer investors and in people aims to reduce staff absenteeism and try to reduce the labor turnover people leaving jobs if people are happy at work they will stay there if they feel the company is helping them and trying to promote their skills and their interest in, in the work that they do and they're being respected and uh, developed, the chances are the staff will want to stay and they'll want to participate more fully in the work of the company. Which of course saves on recruitment costs. Uh, recruitment is an expensive thing for companies to engage in. Um, they may have to employ uh, agents to recruit the right people. Um, they may have to place advertisements in uh, newspapers or in the general press or and then they've got the interviewing and selection and it's it's a costly business recruiting staff. So investors in people by uh, promoting people within work, promoting their interests and developing their skills and uh, acknowledging their contribution, it reduces uh, labour turnover. Now the Department of Business Innovation and Skills, well this is responsible for economic growth through investment in skills and education which in effect helps boost trade, innovation and provides opportunities for individuals to develop their own business. So this is part of the enterprise culture. This is the idea behind the enterprise culture to try and get economic growth through investment in skills and education uh, which in effect helps boost trade. Uh, better work, workmanship, better uh, application within work, uh, the quest for more sales may lead to more trade perhaps international trade, it will lead to innovation, the, the quest to innovate and out-compete out the competitors, provide opportunities for individuals to develop their own business even, because the people feel confident, they have more skills, more competencies, they have been developed. So the aim is to develop economic growth. The department is also responsible for higher education and skills to the business trade. 
So uh, the department looks after universities and colleges and tries to promote general economic growth by having a more productive labour force. Uh, works closely with the skill funding, skills funding agency to fund and promote adult, adult education and skills training in England. Uh, adult education is ongoing because people reach a certain age doesn't mean they can't learn so um, it means that skills are updated and new skills are taught right throughout the working life and it's the function of that particular government department to try and encourage this happening within the workplace. Now the department is responsible for ensuring uh, further and higher education institutions are developing student skills in order to compete in a global employment market. Globalization has blurred uh, boundaries and now many people who are working let's say in the UK will consider themselves not only to be in competition with other companies within the UK but potentially in competition with companies right throughout the world. Um, so globalization means that workers have to have high quality skills in order to survive and the department focuses in on this. It also promotes innovation, entrepreneurship uh, and the science and research industries. Um, it tries to encourage entrepreneurship through setting up new businesses and encouraging people to have ideas and there are various schemes that are run to try and give grants and start up capital to people with good ideas to try and encourage new industry but also promoting research because research may be the starting point of entrepreneurship it also tries to ensure that legislation is fair for customers and businesses. Um, th there should be honest and open information about products and about working conditions and about employment and about contracts and so the department tries to make sure that there is fairness within the labour market. So it, it helps or tries to help new businesses starting up and also existing businesses to grow further. Now the Sector Skills Council, well this is an employer-led organization working in collaboration with uh, UK Commission. The Sector Skills Council aims to sustain economic growth by job creation through employer investment in skills and development. So it's trying to create work by investing in skills and by developing the workforce. It's employer led so it's it's not the government it's um, it's industry trying to put back something put back something in the form of more training for the, the workforce and encouraging entrepreneurship and encouraging development and the, the encouragement of skills and skill development. It's made up from large and small organizations uh, trade unions are involved and also the voluntary sector the focus is to raise employee skill levels and create more jobs. So it's quite straightforward. It's trying to uh, develop employee skills so that there is greater job security, more jobs, better quality work, more economic growth and a more vibrant economy. Now its focus, well develop a world-class labor market. Now I appreciate that every country will want to have a world-class labor market um, but 
it's important that the government and the sector skills council and the trade unions and, and everyone aims towards improving standards. So the sector skills council aims to try to develop the labour market so that it becomes more competitive and more skilled and more capable of taking on international competition. So there's greater investment in employee skills. Employee training and skill development to compete with competitive markets and changing demands of society and organizations. Markets are not static institutions. Markets change. Markets evolve. Tastes change. So that the uh, organizations have constant pressure to try and develop their themselves. Now the strategy, well the strategy is that uh, employer investment in their own employee skills so each employer tries to develop their own employee skills. These are the employers who are members of the Sector Skills Council. So they, they invest in their own employees to try and promote skills. They also try to create career opportunities for young adults to give them a chance to get started and to get careers. And they also try to network so that there is um, a better understanding of needs within different parts of the labour market and there's better communications within the labour market as to what's needed and how to provide it. Now next, Learn Direct. I mentioned this one at the outset. The UK is a leading organisation which aims to introduce innovative techniques and to deliver learning and assessment. So innovative techniques in learning. So the use of uh, online facilities, online learning, uh, the use of um, multimedia, um, the use of highly interactive programs, uh, as well as having centres in which classes and tuition can take place. Now it works with individuals and organisations to develop skills and it tries to um, focus in on the precise skills that the organisations need and tries to tailor what it offers to meet the, those requirements. So it's a very focused uh, service. It looks at precisely what's needed and tries to meet what is needed. Um, Learn Direct was one of the first organizations in the UK to devise unique learning strategies, e-learning and the establishment, as I said earlier, of local centers. Uh, the focus is to offer individuals uh, the opportunity to learn and acquire skills which will help them uh, thrive in today's competitive market. So it's adding to skills, it's adding to the existing skills of workers to make them even more efficient and more competitive and more equipped to deal with uh, situations in the changing market in which we find ourselves, the changing conditions we, in which we find ourselves, the advent of new technology, globalization and so on. It collaborates with existing organizations to help employees develop skills and training. So it doesn't do it alone, it, it looks to other organizations to see what they require and tries to tailor what it does to those requirements. Uh, it's important to harness staff talent, motivation and retention. So it, it, it helps the organizations to provide specific training programs which will develop the staff talent and improve motivation at work and um, cut down on labor turnover. It offers apprenticeships, uh, functional skills, 
computing skills and different qualifications in maths and English and the national vocational qualifications. So it's very practical orientated, looking at what exactly is required within a practical context to try and develop the, the practical skills that industry and commerce need. The Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, well, uh, this is a acknowledged chartered um, HR and development professional body. So it's, it's a chartered human resource and development professional body. So it's, uh, it's got a very high status um, and members of this institution are professional. They are highly trained individuals delivering very high quality um, courses, training and are involved in the general uh, human resource and development fields. It's responsible for supporting and developing staff within organizations. Um, most organizations, most medium to large organizations have specialist human resource and development departments and these will have members of the Institute, generally speaking, involved with them in developing courses and training and um, help in the, the general HR uh, management of the business, selection, recruitment and even exit from the, from the business. The Institute itself offers a range of training and courses for individuals and organizations. So it also is involved in training. Apprenticeship. Well, apprenticeships provide training for individuals in preparation for the world of work, normally to young people leaving uh, school or leaving college who want to um, earn and have an income, earn some money and have an income, have a, a salary or a wage, but also to acquire skills. And an apprenticeship may run over several years in which the person will acquire particular trade skills as a, as a printer or as a, a, a builder or as an engineer or whatever it is. They're offered in a range of occupations where individuals have the opportunity to earn a salary, as I said, and gain some job training. They're available for anyone over the age of 16 and they have the following benefits. The person earns a salary, they get holiday pay, uh, receive training and achieve a qualification and skills. So there are many advantages to been involved in the apprenticeship uh, scheme for young people. Um, to go to college normally involves paying tuition fees and the time spent at college uh, is time that was not used to earn, to earn an income. So apprentice apprenticeships are highly valued. Now the types of apprenticeships, well, they've got different names depending on the types. I'm not going to get involved with the nitty gritty of, of these, but one is trained to gain. Um, that's a type of apprenticeship which has got certain characteristics which, as I said, we don't need to go into. Um, New Deal I mentioned earlier, again, um, just trying to involve employers and apprentices to try and um, uh, promote skills and training within uh, the sector or within the country or within the company, whatever uh, applies. The national vocational qualifications, well, those are used to assess the training that's been delivered to assess its quality and its, its depth to see if it's deep or if it's superficial and also to see um, 
exactly what skills and what training were provided. So it's it's a way of um, assessing the effectiveness of the scheme. Now to conclude this session, well, the government provides a wealth of resources for individuals to gain skills and qualifications for the world of work. The government is constantly looking for ways to promote training and to promote uh, efficiency and long-term growth in the economy. And the best way to do that is to have a skilled labour force and to have a labour force who are constantly being updated. Their skills are being updated, they're being kept abreast of new developments in technology, in uh, working practices and so on. So the government has a role to uh, be involved in this area. Most courses that the government uh, come up with are free or funded by organisations. Uh, we say the word free, of course nothing is free. The courses that are provided by the government are funded by the taxpayer and some courses are funded by companies or by organisations. Government initiatives aid employee development and encourage staff to develop their skills and development. So the government is constantly trying to um, develop individuals and encouraging companies to provide schemes which will facilitate learning and skill development. There is always a, a need to uh, disseminate good quality practice, to, to make it known, to pass the word about what is good practice. And um, the Chartered Institute of Personal Management and Development is it's a good way of uh, passing that information around. Its members get to know about it, it has a professional magazine, and the word gets around. But the government may also um, be involved in passing the information around as well as to what is good practice and helping employers develop training programs which will uh, pass on what is good practice and improve efficiency uh, in that way. So it's, the whole idea is to improve the, the quality of the, the labour force improve the quality of the labour force, improve their motivation, improve their effectiveness, um, it will reduce labour turnover, it will promote economic growth, more efficiency, more competitiveness, which in a society which is changing because of the, the onset of technology and also because of globalisation, these are important skills. So there are different agencies in the country that are trying to do these. And this little session is looking at various agencies that have come into existence in the UK. Other countries will have different arrangements, but the desire to have a more efficient workforce uh, is presumably the same in every country. It's how to do it that may vary. That's all I'm going to do in this session. Um, there are many references that um, may be used to pick up on this, but um, essentially what we need to know out of this session is simply the importance of training and the fact that there are practical schemes that governments and employers and organisations put in place to try and develop the skills within the workforce. So with that I'm going to leave it for there and say Thank you for watching.